Okay, so I want to have a look at this Scene Master HO 187 scale high rail excavator. Um, when I first looked at this, I wasn't overly sure about the quality of it uh, because the photo on the box isn't really a good indicator, although it does show uh, a nice shot of it, but you can't really tell unless you actually look at the kit. And oftentimes, I prefer an injection molded kit because they're more crisp, you know, than uh, die cast for sure. But then you have to build it, but they're not that really difficult of a kit really. I was able to assemble all this in a couple of hours. And uh, it uh, assembles pretty good according to instructions. There's a few niggles like some of the pins on this articulating arm. Uh, you know, the holes don't match up. Uh, as good as I thought maybe they should but it's overall a pretty nice little kit uh, it is delicate like all this is movable uh, like the bucket it comes with three options a bucket a, a demo bucket a gravel bucket and a crane which is kind of nice and uh, as long as you don't you know reef on it too much or try to move it around uh, more than maybe you should I guess uh, it seems to hold its position well um, and all these parts here, like the high rail uh, components, you know, went together fairly well. And they're, you know, some moving jacks, like on the hydraulic jacks on the side here, you know, like unfold. Like they sit up like that. And then they come down. So you can, you know, pose it the way you want, I guess. Um, and leave it all loose if you want, if you want to just dis display it on, on different places on your layout. Um, here's the chassis, which, uh, in interesting enough, it has an articulating or pivoting diff on the front. Uh, I don't know why they didn't do it on the rear, but I guess that's just for the front of it when it needs to deflect like that, I guess, when it's loading and so on. But anyway, that's kind of a nice touch. So those parts look really good. Uh, the cab is not bad. It's just a little plug that pops in with a uh, clear plastic window, which I won't put in until I paint it. But it's just got a seat in there. The actual handles, the control sticks, and the steering wheel is actually quite good. I was really impressed with that, with the size of it, you know, how small and delicate it is. And the engraving on the model is pretty good, you know, for 187, you know, like uh, when you're used to looking at larger scale and you see a model like this, you know, it's it's impressive, right? Like all the detail on the top of the the main body of the machine is good. Uh, there was a break in the handle here. I mean, I might have broke that, but I can replace that with a piece of rod. Um, I mean, a person could add little hydraulic cables to this out of jeweler's wire to add a few details to it as well. I might do that. Then there's this real rear slug piece, and they give you a bunch of ball bearings. I find if you put four in, uh, that that's enough to balance it out. You know, the weight of it when you got the bucket or the arm stretched out. It balances itself quite well. And then it just pops into the top of the chassis here, and, and uh, it'll still pivot. So... And then the tires look pretty good, too. They're really, really well detailed. I really like those. And they look good. I'll just paint them on this sprue here. And the same for the rims. They're very detailed. Like I was surprised that they went as far as they did to detail the rims, the, the bolts and the rivets there. And there's the plastic axles. But I would say overall it's a, it's a very nice little model. Uh, you know, for those of you that are thinking of getting an excavator, in this case a high rail excavator for your layout, which, you know, which mo like what model railroad doesn't have one, you know. And they're different, right? So, and you can put it on the tracks or beside the tracks or on a flat car or whatever. So, yeah, and and the assembly is really fairly basic and straightforward. A little bit fiddly, the arm here, but, you know, it's a nice little model. And the fact that it's probably because it's a model, not a lot of people are going to have one. So, unless you want to build one yourself. So we'll paint her up and see what she looks like, and uh, I'm sure it'll fit right in on River Road.
Okay, I just wanted to show you that I decided to add these some of these pieces of uh, 28 gauge jewelry wire picked up at Michael's. Different color rolls. In this case, they had a black one, which is kind of nice. And then I just took a little piece of uh, scrap plastic and then just put in five or six of these and then bent it over like that and a bit of CA and then cut that off and then put the piece down inside of there and then I can reef on them pretty good and stretch them and bend them over the arm here and so I put two into these cylinders here and yeah, just to suggest like just a little extra added little detail that helps make the model stand out a little bit more okay little things like that sometimes make a big difference you know when you're sort of modeling um, particularly in HO scale okay so I'm almost finished the hydraulic cables on here to my satisfaction but I want to show you a mistake I made and uh, it's too bad because everything else worked out so when I I drilled out the holes in the ram like in these hydraulic rounds where the cables were inserted uh, uh, they all worked out good except this one here I drilled in just a bit too deep and when I put the wire in it was fine but some of the CA got inside and seized this rod in the ram so now I can't move this part of the arm. Um, like the main boom articulates, see there, although tight, but that's okay. This one goes up and down, and the bucket one works too. But it is a little bit fragile, so it, like it won't, like these hinge systems here on the model aren't really that great. But you know, it's pr a pretty good achievement for a little model. I mean, look how small it is, right? Um, so what I can do is I can either just leave it like this because it's just going to be in, in sort of static display anyway in, in and around the track wherever you decide to put it but I can easily just cut that off re-drill that that core piece out because it's not glued right inside and then I can put a piece of 80 thou rod and crush the end and round it off and drill and put a pin through here and it would be actually better than the model if I did that and that's no biggie but Right now I'm just going to leave it. So, and then I put a couple of straps here, 10 by 20 thou, you can see here. I just tag this end first and let it dry. And then this is what I do. Is I just, just to clean it up a bit, I just, I'll just pull that over. Push that. hydraulic cable in or hose pardon me and then take a little bit of this solvent okay and then you can see I used some of this wire because this little grab handle broke here and it was kind of thick so I just cut it off and then I drilled a hole here and a hole there and I inserted the same wire that I used for these hydraulic hoses for right here and then I just used my pliers to you know straighten it out like that So, you know, that looks a little bit better, right? Let's paint it up. Okay, so I want to take this opportunity to show you the advantages of an airbrush in terms of light and shadow. When you're working with white, and black in other words this is shadow and this is white and you'll notice that when I move my hand over like see how like really look at it like where my shadow is like that's not white that's gray right isn't it that's white this is black and there's gray see 
And this is one of the fundamentals that is advantageous to learn when we're painting any scale model because it adds the illusion of depth and scale to a miniature. And I'll give you an example here with just a sphere and what you can do with an airbrush. You can do a lot of blending with a traditional brush and water like wet on wet and oil painting with transparency and so on. But this is really difficult to achieve without an airbrush and this is why an airbrush is to your advantage when you're painting light and shadow, like in any color, okay? Okay, so notice how this is a two-dimensional surface, paper, but look at how just a circle with an airbrush with darker shadow here and then lighter here, how it makes that look three-dimensional, like it's a sphere, with just a quick pass of the airbrush, right? So if you learn to understand this principle when you paint a scale model, you'll increase the quality and look of the model like this is what creates the pop factor okay and that is the advantage of an airbrush that just comes eventually with practice you know it's just something that you learn to do like if you really thin your paint okay so in this case this is Tamiya and you can see it's actually not as thin as it can be but the thinner it is the nicer the line that you can do see and this is just a fat needle tip this is just a this is like i bought this airbrush like 26 27 years ago it was one of the many i had in my kit but it was my go-to airbrush you know um and i still use it today and it hasn't worn out yet but i've only shot isopropyl alcohol and to me acrylic through it so it hasn't hurt the seals and it's always self-cleaning when you use an ipa but the thinner the paint and the higher the pressure and with a tight trigger you can get thin lines like this see Or you can get wide lines like that. And you can get in really close as well. Okay. Okay, so now that I have all the parts blacked out, this is my shadow layer, okay? Think in terms of this is the extreme of shadow. Black is the extreme of shadow. White is the extreme of light, right? So those vary when you apply glazes and transparent washes and filters, and that factor is always in there somewhere. But if you understand black and white in terms of the opposite spectrum of light and shadow then that'll help with uh, your paint application down the road so I'm gonna take a little bit of white and I thinned it 25% uh, pigment pretty much uh, meaning I take a brand new bottle and I top it off with isopropyl stir it up mix it up and then I take 25% of that and add 75% isopropyl alcohol to get a nice thin mix and if it's too thin or too heavy then I just change it up a little bit with an eyedropper or I just do it by hand until I feel that it's right on a piece of practice paper okay so for the purposes of of this demo I'm going to spray some white on this model it's going to be yellow like the the actual body uh, but I'm going to do this just so that you can see the contrast and what a lighter color does over top of dark okay Watch how it brings up the highlights. Like it highlights things and makes things pop.
treat it sort of like a black and white photograph. This is why I should mention at this point too, like you notice my photographs, like I prefer black and white photos because I want to understand the light and shadow and how it plays on a building or a model or any object or subject matter, right? Color is, is, is something that you just shift to the background. You want to see where the light is and where the shadow is playing first. Like just get that in your mind. Like just feed it into your mind. Like don't worry about trying to create a practical application of that. Just study the photo that way. The mind is a powerful thing. And then when you begin to paint and manifest, it comes out and it starts to play on the model when you're painting it. Once you understand that principle, okay? So essentially what you're doing is, is you're turning this into a type of a gray, but you can see the relief, the engraving, how dark it is. See that? And all the areas where the white doesn't go, like look at the bucket. So this is a black and white photograph, let's say, right? Look at the bucket. That's the way it would look, right? From a distance without any color. And then you can increase the brilliance of the white by staying on a particular part longer. See? Try to see that as light, intensity of light. More light on the top if the sun is at high noon, let's say. Okay, let's have a look at the chassis. Watch what happens. See? When you begin to understand that light and shadow principle, it'll affect the way you paint as you change colors as well as you darken colors and lighten colors. Or with this, you can just start putting washes on it, even umber washes over that, and it would darken it more. And that white and that black distinction there that you see will still play through the thin layers of washes. See? That's the idea of layering it like that. Like here's an example of the inside of the cab, which, you know, isn't going to be really viewed at this scale that close, but watch what happens. See that? You wouldn't need to do the back of the seat because you because there's no light there anyway. Okay, so this is the primary base layers and the fundamentals of using an airbrush to create light and shadow. And then you can work in layers after that. Like even these tires, watch, like see the tread? See how it begins to achieve a similar result. And then I can just put washes over these tires, like even a black wash later, right? I can put a black thin pin wash to knock down the white, the highlight more. But where the engraving is, where the black is, it's, is just going to re-darken it. Another shade, see? Okay, so now I'm going to take a little bit of yellow and just, just put a little bit of yellow highlights around and about the high points. Like, not paint the whole machine yellow but just just some areas because I'm going to chase all this with washes later like with a traditional brush like just like I did the dozer like the cat dozer you know very similar that way okay
I'm not even worried about the grates because I can put a pin wash in them later. I want to treat this just as a layer, right? And of course I'm going to leave the cab black. And I'm not even going to paint the side of the edge of this lid here, the engine uh, hood. I'm just going to leave that. Okay, so this was achieved with XF1 black, XF2 white, and XF3 flat yellow. They're all flats, all primers, right? With the airbrush, thin, 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 thin paint, right? With a few layers, light dusting of layers. That was achieved, like that's just the basis of a paint job in this particular case, in this demonstration. Now I've got something to work with. Now I can start applying washes to this to darken this chassis and weather it up in mud and rust with the wet on wet. Okay, remember how I showed that? Wet on wet. The tires put washes on those. The rims, you can see, like they look gray, but there was no gray paint used. There's no gray paint here. You don't really need gray when you have an airbrush with black and white anyway, because you can render anything gray with the two of these, right? And then this yellow, and then you can see already the like the, there isn't even a wash on this particular model, but you can see already the engraving how it helps make the model pop. So when I do a little bit of dry brushing, let's say, or washes to change up some of the colors here, the yellow hue and tone and so on, and then put pin washes into these areas here, it's going to make it pop more, right? See this chassis is still wet, yeah, a little bead of water, take a little burnt umber, touch it around the... Uh, just be patient with it, watch what happens too, when those layers, you know, use thin layers and watch what happens to the colors when they flood into each other, let it dry, if you see something good happening, leave it. Okay, see that? That was just, right, so we have the base coat of the white over the black, remember? And then I put water on there and added some dark sea gray, just a little mottled, pooled up a bit. And then added a little more water and just put a touch of burnt umber with a brush onto there. And look what it's done. Like, see how the white, see how the white shows through the umber wash there? I mean, how else do you create those kind of effects like that? You know, this is what happens when you do wet on wet and you do thin layers. That's the effects that you get. Imagine applying, applying that to an undeck locomotive or one that's already painted and you want to weather it down, right? And they're water-based paints, they're safe. So, you know, you, it's hard to go wrong if you build them up in subtle layers first. But that there, I just love that. I didn't plan that. Okay, so just continuing right along here with washes. Now here's the top of the body of the deck here. Look, uh, let's just take some of this gray black here. And this uh, particular cover right here, I think is black. 
normally, but let's just leave that yellow, but let's just dab in some stronger black here and build it up. Rather than paint it opaque black. That would be boring. See, look already the highlights showing through, see? Uh, let's just put some on top of here because after all we can dry brush later and make this area pop with some yellow later. I find this to be a good method to paint small detail parts too rather than trying to flood in opaque colors and have it run out onto a surface you don't want to. Uh, you can control it with a flood and then but just flood it two or three times. Okay so I'm going to take a little bit of this aluminum number 71.062 by Vallejo. I really like this actually. It's a nice paint for just a water-based aluminum. It's I would say it's probably one of the best aluminum paints I've ever used because it's and it's simple to uh, you know to use. I just put a little bit of a stab there on the end of the blade here. And then I'll just throw another wash over top of that of rust just to suggest some wear and tear there on the fresh metal and then along here. You can see some already decided to bleed along there. Goes a long ways this stuff too. I'm gonna touch up these hydraulic rods anyway. Really nice uh, silver look, this aluminum color. I like it. Um, Don't worry too much about when you're doing the vents and stuff, if it overruns or floods onto the surface of the model. You can always chase that later on at the end. You can take a little bit of yellow, you know, of, of your choice and just, you know, highlight that panel close to the grill and just clean it up, right? And besides, I mean, if you look at an excavator, it doesn't take long for them to get pretty ratty looking, right? If you've been around them.
Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to flood or wet on wet. I use flood as a slang kind of for to do flood painting, but it's actually just wet on wet. I'm going to apply some of this yellow ochre with water again, the same way that I did the yard office, right? It's the same methodology, okay? I'll show you an example here which will get covered up by the cab anyway where it's darker, like right here on this platform here. I'll show you what it does. So I lay down some water. And I'll just take a stab of this yellow and put it on there. See how it builds up a layer? doing the same on this top of this deck, see? I'm just sort of stabbing it on in a similar way that you would use oil paint. Some oil painters, you know, or, or modelers that paint by putting the little dots of oil and then blending it in. You, you do the similar thing with acrylics, but you just let the water kind of flood it around. Because acrylic is not like oil, it's not transparent, it doesn't, it's not greasy, right? Like it wants to dry fast. The water suspends the uh, drying part down. It, 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 it um, inhibits it to, to cure and dry. And as long as you keep it wet, uh, then it won't dry. But as soon as you leave it alone for a while, it starts to dry. And it'll do different things. Sometimes it'll leave a little flood mark, sometimes it'll leave a nice blemish. It might just dry without anything, just the way it looks now. It, see, that's the way it is with acrylics like this. And that's why it really works really nice for small scale like this, because it, the effect that it actually leaves on the model. And you'll see some of this original yellow is, works too, as it looks like a kind of a fade. Okay, a little bit of a fade.
Yeah, I just want to show you a couple of shots here of the progress so far. Uh, so you can see, you know, with the layers, the, the sort of, the, you know, the wet on wet layers, uh, this model began by painting it black, all black and then white, dusting over white, just highlighting, which kind of rendered it a kind of shaded gray. And then just started adding colors in wet on wet. And you can see some, like, this particular part right here, which is what I like, but this is the kind of thing that happens when you learn to paint like this. See the the the, fa the different variations of color there, the staining, and the looks like sun bleached yellow and oxidization. You know, which is something that you that you can't you know manipulate with a brush even sometimes. It's just by applying those different layers and just letting them have their way, and then if you like it, you leave it. You can see I've just been stabbing in with lots of water yellow ochre here over top of the black or the gray right that was you know the black white initial coats that I demonstrated you just build up these thin layers and then when you decide that you like it you just leave it and at this stage right here you could uh, lay another couple of layers of oil paints which are truly transparent, right? Which takes it to another level. But you can see there, I'm gonna work in a little bit more of this yellow ochre, and then I'm gonna highlight with just this yellow, like a brighter yellow. I'll just show you the difference here. See? So this is what's on there now, and then I'll just come back and I'll just highlight with this brighter yellow, like uh, the tops of edges some of the top surfaces wet on wet just to give it an extra highlight pop and then you can see the very dark gray black is down inside it's just left behind and this was just washes of black built up which is really just a dark gray right and then the same for these hydraulic cylinders are just thin very thin black just build up two or three layers try not to paint it all at once because you'll just carry paint over onto things that you won't want to if you use the thin wash to build up to get the color, you can always wash it away if it if you have a bit of a boo-boo or something and get some black on yellow or something. You can just take a bit of water right away and just sort of wash it away. That's the beauty of uh, learning to paint with acrylics like this. They're fast drying and there's no odor, you know, so. And the colors are bright, very bright, because of the opaque quality to them. And then you can see here, this was just black, right, the chassis, and then dusted over with white. And then, of course, I took some washes of raw umber and, in this case, concrete, number 71.131, which is a nice sort of earthy tone as well. Like, I would say it's close to the equivalent of Tamiya Earth, but just water-based in this case. And uh, just a little wash of silver on the wheels. Right. with another wash of umber just very light thin washes just play around until and let it settle out until you like it and that's pretty effective right there and I just put a little stain there I'm not sure what I did there it might have been a little bit of aluminum with a bit of earth wash over top again and then some raw umber around this uh, pivoting uh, bearing for the actual cab you know Right. Okay.